pathology of, of Alzheimer's and other dementias. And I'll point that out a little bit, but, but for example, with sleep, we've learned so much about sleep, but also Alzheimer's by trying to study the mechanisms. Um, of course, by understanding who's at risk, you can also try and keep close track of these people. Maybe these are the people you wanna screen more regularly. And really, ultimately, we care about modifiable risk factors because maybe we can do something about this, whether it's prevention or treatments. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those options. The, the things that I'm gonna talk about today, I, I can't cover everything. I'm gonna really focus on four things that I think have the best evidence, and then talk a little bit hints of some things that look promising, but, but some of our other speakers will, will talk on those a little bit more in depth. So I'm gonna focus on cardiovascular risk factors, physical activity, sleep, and TBI, and do a, sort of a real whirlwind of this. Um, the premise here is that we think about 50% of the variants of, of Alzheimer's and other dementia are environmental, okay? And, and we're just beginning to understand a lot of this. 50% uh, probably genetic, and of course, there's a lot of, of um, you know, interplay between those two that I won't have time to talk about. One thing I want to talk about, which won't be a surprise or, or at all um, new to, to you, is this idea of a life course approach of cognitive aging. Most of my colleagues don't really understand this. They start studying people in their 70s and 80s, and they say, oh, X is associated with, with Alzheimer's. But we've completely forgotten about the prior 70 years. And you, of course, understand this completely, whether it's even you know, preconception or, or in utero or childhood, uh, childhood adversity, um, early adulthood, et cetera. So I think this is a really important concept that's finally getting to, to the more Alzheimer's world. And I'll touch a little bit on this in, in some of my work. So cardiovascular risk factors. What do I mean by cardiovascular risk factors? Hypertension, diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, the usual suspects. This has a huge body of evidence, and I think it's probably one of the best underpinnings of, of things we can do something about vis-a-vis -vis, uh, cognitive aging. <clears throat> uh, there's some question about when. Is it earlier in life? Is it midlife? Is it late life? We did some work a while ago where we showed that late life metabolic syndrome was associated with risk of dementia. And there was an interesting interaction with inflammation, suggesting that there are people with, with high levels of in, inflammatory markers that, that may be particularly increased risk. Uh, Rebecca Gottesman, uh, the panel, um, I guess it's your right, um, uh, did some nice work looking at midlife hypertension. And so she looked at different um, systolic blood pressure in midlife, and she found that uh, this had a big impact on PET amyloid later in life. And it was particularly true in terms of APOE4. So, so if you were E4 positive, you had an even greater risk, and this was uh, um, statistically significant. Again, this interesting interplay between traditional vascular risk factors and amyloid and, and now tau. And so we think that there's really a, a very close relationship with these vascular risk factors and the biomarkers of AD. More recently, we've really tried to push this envelope about the life course. When does it matter? When, when does, does it matter when you have high blood pressure or, or even low, high, high normal? Um, we did some work with Cardia, which is the panel on the left, where we actually summed <clears throat> using the AUC curves as sort of a novel way to sort of get a cumulative exposure of blood pressure. In this case, it was systolic blood pressure. And we went from early 20s to, to midlife. And we found, lo and behold, even this high normal level, cumulative high systolic pressure, not hypertension, was associated with all three of the cognitive tests. It was amazing at age 50. So it, I think it's really showing us that this, this exposure from, uh, at least in this case, um, early adulthood really matters in terms of setting us up for our cognitive aging trajectories. And now we're, we're trying to study that much more in depth. Uh, also recently, we tried to do a pooling project where we combined um, Cardia, Mesa, CHS, and Health ABC. And we were able to look across the life course in all of those cohorts and to be able to compare, not just does each time point matter, and of course they do, but it, is it um, one more than the other? And, and in our hands, it looks like it's the, the early life exposures that probably matter when you co-vary for the other times, they matter the most, which is really interesting. Is that because they're, they're more severe 
or is it a genetic issue? We don't know, or is it just that they've been exposed now for much longer? And you probably are aware of this very important trial called SPRINT. They had a, a, an ancillary study, well, actually it wasn't an answer, but, but part of SPRINT, they looked at dementia outcomes, and lo and behold, they found that if you more aggressively treat systolic blood pressure, you actually had a reduction in MCI and dementia, which is very exciting. It's one of the first trials that's really shown we can reduce MCI and dementia by this aggressive blood pressure uh, control. So very exciting. I think we're gonna see a lot more now around vascular exposures and, and cognitive aging. What about physical activity? You know physical activity much better than I do. Uh, extremely important for all kinds of, of life and health outcomes. We did some work a long time ago where we showed just looking at how much women walked, these are older women, how much they walked had a real association with, with change in cognition over about eight years. And um, at the time, nobody even believed this. This was probably, I think, the first study to look at physical activity and cognitive change over time in, in aging. We now know that physical activity does all kinds of things, whether it's BDNF or cytokines and, and uh, hippocampal volume. Um, and this is some work uh, from Rabin where they, they showed that actually if you're physically active, even if you have high amyloid in your brain, it can buffer against the effects on cognitive decline. So suggesting that it, it's something you can do, even if you have amyloid or tau or, or genetic predisposition, by doing some of these really important lifestyle modifications, you might even buffer, maybe not forever, but maybe delay. Uh, <clears throat> of course, there've been some trials. This is where it gets a little more controversial. There was a big trial called the LIFE trial, which did not show any benefit on cognitive outcomes, which really sort of, I think, set the field back a little bit in terms of, of Alzheimer's and, and cognitive aging. But some other work by um, Nicola Lautenschlager earlier had found that randomized to exercise actually did benefit those who had an MCI uh, subjective memory problems. So I think the jury's still out a little bit in terms of of uh, rolling this out in a public health space, but most people do recommend physical activity as a way to benefit the whole body, but also uh, cognition. What about sleep? Sleep, I think I alluded to this, fascinating. It's told us so much. Why do we spend a third of our time in sleep? Well, because it's, it's really fundamental. It allows us to clear out the brain, we think, using the lymphatic system. You can clear out the toxins, uh, particularly in, in, in my case, the relevant ones of amyloid and tau. And um, so beautiful, beautiful rodent uh, models have shown this. And now we're able to show it in people. If you don't sleep as well, you accumulate greater amyloid and tau. And what does this mean in terms of actual outcomes? We and others have now done a, a, a number of studies. I think we, we clearly know that, that sleep is a so sleep and sleep different um, disorders, whether it's circadian rhythm shifts, sleep duration, your quality of sleep, sleep disordered breathing, all of these now have been shown very clearly to be associated with risk of, of dementia and um, including Alzheimer's. And um, some beautiful work just recently came out in JAMA Neurology where they showed sleep duration, sort of this U-shaped curve a little bit in terms of, of amyloid as shown on PET scans. So if you're not sleeping as much, it seems that you're gonna be accumulating greater amyloid. Little bit of a, of a question about is it, is it chicken or egg that I think we need to know much more now in terms of um, prospective studies and also trials. I think the field is ready for trials. If you can improve sleep, do you have a downstream effect on cognition? I don't think we know that yet, but my guess is yes. Finally, traumatic brain injury, TBI. You've all heard a lot of this. It's front page New York Times. TBI, very important in terms of a risk factor for, for dementia. We've done some work primarily with uh, large VA data, the uh, veterans health data. It turns out they've been collecting EMR since the early 90s. We've been able to harness this and, and look at, at TBI as a risk for dementia. And we found that even mild TBI, even TBI without loss of consciousness, increases your risk of developing dementia. So very important. The question is why? What, what is this? Is it, is it a you know, vascular insult? Is it because you had the trauma and then that reduces your reserve? 
That's probably the case for more moderate to severe, but not so much for mild. Um, is it an amyloid pathway, tau? What is it? Is it CTE? What is CTE? So CTE has gotten a lot of press, but really CTE is a pathologic finding. So what does CTE look like in humans when they're alive? We don't really know. We did some work with a a cohort of about 200 older um, adults who had had TBI, many times actually quite remote TBI, decades before. And what we found, we looked at a number of biomarker profiles. What we found, at least in our hands, it doesn't look like it's amyloid. It looks like it's inflammation. It's, it's neurofibrillary light protein, which is sort of a nonspecific marker of, of degradation, of neurodegeneration, and PTAU. So it seems like it's not the amyloid path, and, and some others have shown that too. They have not shown as much of an increase of, of um, amyloid on PET, although it's somewhat controversial. My guess is it's gonna be a mixed bag, but that this is really gonna be primarily along the tau pathway uh, with, with tau deposition and um, probably some vascular and inflammatory changes. Some promising behavioral risk factors that I'm not gonna get into much. One is depression. Alyssa alluded to this yesterday. I, I couldn't agree with more. I mean, the, what, what our, our, the younger generation is dealing with in terms of anxiety and depression is so critical and exacerbated, of course, by COVID. Uh, we did this work sort of on that life course approach where we looked at um, depression at different times in life. And we found, of course, depression in, in early adulthood mattered a lot, maybe even more than at other time periods. You can see here stratified by, by men and women. Um, if you look at the early adulthood, you can see that, that um, having high depression symptoms really mattered in terms of this late life. This was from that pooling cohort. And, and lo and behold, last week, as I'm trying to keep my eyes awake and watch the first episode of Saturday Night Live, lo and behold, in the weekend update, they showed this picture. I'm like, oh my God, that's our study. And, and then they proceeded to show Billie Eilish carrying a sign saying, where am I? So, <laughs> so it was very funny, but I figure my research has reached new heights with SNL, the weekend update. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it was very funny and I thought, if I hadn't stayed awake for this, you know, I would never have known. But, but anyway, um, some other areas that we're going to hear a little bit more about today, but but I think are looking really promising. One is sensory loss. We don't think about this, and I think a lot of people dismiss sensory loss, hearing loss, vision impairment. They thought, well, it's a measurement bias, which of course it, it could be as well. But we're starting to understand it's probably more than that. It's it's probably um, related to social isolation. It's related maybe to depression. It's related to probably parts of the brain that have have um, neurodegeneration, maybe a prodrome. The really interesting area that I think we're gonna hear a lot more about. Diet, everybody asks about diet. I think that we're getting there. I think the quality of the evidence hasn't been as good, but I think we're slowly getting there. It looks like it's the mind diet or, or sort of a Mediterranean sort of more style diet that seems to be the, the best evidence. Social engagement, we're gonna hear. Um, um, in, in a minute from Carlos about social engagement. So I'm gonna skip over that. And so where are we now with this? It's really interesting. A few years ago, two reports came out a month apart from one another. It was fascinating. One of them was from the National Academy of Medicine, a steer body, um, you know, did, there was a committee. I happened to serve on the committee and basically the bar was set very high. You had to have an RCT, randomized control trial, of at least 500 people per arm. You had to have you know, long follow-up. You had to have all this stuff. Kind of like they were coming from that, I think, the, um, you know, the, the cardiovascular world or the cancer world, expecting all these. Well, guess what? There aren't many of these trials. So at the end of the day, there was very little to conclude because they, weren't, they didn't exist. And I remember the first meeting, I said, you know, we're setting ourselves up for like a disaster here. And of course, that's what happened. Nothing works. Um, maybe a few things look promising, blood pressure, physical activity, cognitive activity. A month later, the Lancet Commission came out. They said, oh my gosh, there are these nine things, definitive proof, definitely do them all, you know, roll them out. And it was really funny. Now their body of evidence was much more observational studies. They were expert opinions and it was very confusing. So I think people are really confused. Is this something that we should be doing? What's the quality of the evidence? Of course, I think that the, you know, it's, it's in between. I think it's looking very good, but um, we do need more work. And then of course we need more RCTs. So there have been a couple RCTs. One is the finger trial, which you probably are aware of. 
it was a multi-domain trial. So what they did, this is a Finnish study, and what they did was they randomized people to, to control or to four different interventions sort of combined into one. So it was cardiovascular disease, exercise, uh, cognitive stimulation, and um, kind of a diet they gave uh, 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 um, supplements. Um, and what they found at the end of two years, which was sort of amazing, was that actually the, the cognition was better in the intervention group, not on all domains, but certainly more on processing speed and executive function, um, not memory, which is sort of concerning to me a little bit. But now finger has sort of expanded. There's a worldwide finger. So there's a lot of these multi-domain trials now underway, including um, finally one in the US, and then the one that we're leading called the SMART trial. I'm very excited about this trial. It's a personalized trial. So what we did was we're working with Kaiser and we're taking people who are at risk because they're older, they have subjective cognitive complaints, um, they, have, they have to have at least two risk factors. Our feeling was you can't intervene if people don't have risk factors and why would they pick to improve their sleep if their sleep is just fine? So we let them pick. We say, what do you wanna work on? And then we, they work with health coaches and they work with different um, apps and, and, and different um, classes, et cetera, whatever they wanna do. And then when that sort of comes along, then they, they can pick something else to work on. So we're very excited about this, hit very hard by COVID. So we have some delays, but um, we're hoping that we'll have these results next year. Um, the, the outcomes are somewhat cognition, but really we're also trying to see, can we change behavior? So that's really not trivial, as you know, and, and people say they want to change behaviors. They think that if they know they have a risk for Alzheimer's, this is really motivating, but it's hard to get people to change behavior. So we'll see, um, but we're very excited about this. And um, I think that's it. Uh, where are we? I, you know, I think it, we're, we're almost ready for prime time. There are a number of different strategies we can roll out. They're low cost, um, unlike Aduhelm, which costs $100,000 um, a, a year and is very invasive and, and um, unclear whether it really works or not. These things we can roll out very easily, physical activity, cognitive activity, improving sleep hygiene, um, wearing a helmet to avoid uh, TBIs, et cetera. Uh, we need more studies. We need connection with, with uh, biomarkers. I think this life course approach is really important. And um, ultimately my prediction is that Alzheimer's prevention and cognitive aging will be a lot like cardiovascular disease. It'll be a combination. We'll have lifestyle, we'll have drugs, we'll have a drug for tau, maybe one for amyloid, et cetera. And I think um, we're, we're really excited that that day is on the horizon. So thank you. That was a wonderful overview. Um, as a reminder, we're gonna take questions and have discussion at the end. Those of you who are attending by Zoom, if you'd like to start putting questions in the chat now, you may. So next up, we have Dr. Carlos Mendez de Leon, who is a professor of epidemiology at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Prior to that, he was a professor of internal medicine and preventative medicine at Rush University Medical Center. Uh, I think we were there in Chicago at the same time. And uh, he was the director of the Rush Institute Healthy Aging. Uh, he's a social epidemiologist. His research focuses on major health problems and health disparities later in life. And today he will talk about social engagement as an intervention target for dementia prevention. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I certainly wanted to join Christine in thanking uh, Alyssa for, uh, and her team for putting this wonderful conference together on these wonderful grounds here. It's really a great pleasure to be in person again and having all these conversations uh, with one another. Uh, it's, it's truly, truly memorable. It will be truly memorable as the first post-pandemic uh, in-person or hybrid meeting, if you will. Um, I, before I start, uh, I wanted to share with you uh, that actually after my arrival on Friday, I had a little bit of a health scare Friday night here, uh, which prompted me to go to the emergency room in Santa Cruz in the hospital there. Had myself checked out, everything was fine, there was nothing wrong, and was very relieved. And then I had to, of course, to wait another hour for my discharge notes. Uh, uh, that I received, and I actually read them, read through them, 
And lo and behold, uh, I wanted to share with you uh, what it contained, at least in part. And it had some recommendations for lifestyle. Try to control or lower your stress levels. <laughs> now, here we go. What do we do for that? Meditation or yoga, cognitive or behavioral therapy, acupuncture or massage therapy. So do not think for a second that your work doesn't have an impact. It has an incredible impact already has. In fact, an argument could be, make, be made that your work is done. Thank you very much. Maybe we can all go home now. But wait, one thing was missing, of course. What was missing? What was missing? The sauna was missing, the sauna. Thank you so much, Ashley, for bringing that to our attention. So ABMR is alive and well again. We can move forward with our, the incredible research that's done uh, by the members of uh, this academy. <coughs> um, so I want to talk with you this morning about social engagement, its role in dementia, dementia of risk, and potentially as a target of modification. And sit back, relax. I'm not going to inundate you with research from, you know, using all sorts of wearables around our wrists and arms and legs to measure social engagement that would produce like gazillion tons of data. Uh, I'm not going to do this. This is going to be much simpler. Gazillion tons of data from maybe seven subjects or five subjects. I forget, um, you know, that's my sign of aging. Uh, no, this is going to be uh, a little bit more straightforward. And I wanted to talk first about what we mean by social engagement. And there are some complexities, some nuances here. And, you know, on, on this slide, you see how we think about social engagement. There are various ways of conceptualizing what we mean by social engagement. So, uh, you know, may, perhaps most directly, we can think of it as social activity or social participation. Uh, but under the general rubric of social engagement, we have also um, looked at several other markers uh, of that concept, such as net total network size. Uh, another um, way of thinking about it's not just network size, but network diversity, the diversity in our social networks, in our social relationships. Social support, of course, has always been an important aspect of the work in social engagement and health and aging. And then finally, maybe the other side of the coin is social isolation. <laughs> and um, there has been a fair amount of research, uh, Christine already mentioned that, uh, and I just listed a number of publications in this domain ranging from back in 1999 <laughs> to uh, very recently. And uh, it, it, what I try to emphasize here for you is that if you do a, some sort of lit uh, search on this, it's actually a little bit complicated because we use so many different terms, right? Uh, I've underlined the different terms in these papers, ranging from social disengagement to social in integration to social resources, social networks, social isolation, positive psychosocial factors. So we use all sorts of terms in order to get that this concept of social engagement. You also see in the bold uh, typefaced uh, words, the range of journals in which this work is published, right? Ranging from internal medicine and neurology to gerontology journal, public health, epidemiology, psychosomatic medicine, of course, and the, the psychology journals. Uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, one finding that's the, not the only one finding, but one finding uh, that is about this idea of network diversity that a doctoral student, student of mine uh, uh, worked on uh, with me uh, several years ago, uh, where we actually demonstrated that it's actually not total social network size that is important in predicting cognitive decline, but it is in the diversity of our social relationships. You have to think of this as role relationships, that the, the more diverse role relationships you have as an older adult, that seems to provide some protection against cognitive decline. That would be the coefficient at the bottom right of it there, that uh, coefficient that is 0 0.014, uh, that is positive, that's the interaction between network diversity and time suggesting a positive uh, effect on, um, on cognition over time. Um, as I mentioned, the other side of the coin, and if we think more in terms of risk factors, um, 
uh, we can think of social isolation. And social isolation, of course, is a very important concept, uh, particularly since the uh, start of the pandemic, as we shall see in a second. And normally uh, we define these in two different ways in terms of structural social isolation. I like the term structural better, by the way, than objective, uh, which basically means having few or no uh, social relationships or infrequent social contact or the functional aspect of uh, social isolation, which is feeling isolated, feeling lonely. Um, clearly, loneliness and social isolation was a very important challenge for older adults during the pandemic, as you see on the left here, uh, where I um, use some data from the uh, uh, University of Michi Michigan National Poll on Healthy Aging. That's a very large sample. I'm not quite sure how representative, uh, but it's a survey conducted online. And you see an increase in, uh, in several metrics of social isolation, uh, isolation there, sort of feeling a lack of companionship that increased from 34 to 41%, an increase uh, almost doubling from feeling isolated from others and having infrequent social context. So clearly there has been this incredible increase in prevalence of social, isolations, social isolation among older adults. On the right side, you see um, the sort of the prevalence of both total social isolation and severe isolation. And you know, combined that's almost a quarter of the older adult uh, population. And so if you are an epidemiologist like myself, you think immediately in terms of population attributable risk. So changing social isolation may actually have an impact at the population level in preventing disease, preventing cognitive decline. Uh, there is a, a fair amount of evidence on the connection between social isolation and loneliness and dementia risk that is summarized here. For the sake of time, I will not go into the details of these uh, findings, uh, but at least you see at the right hand sign, uh, right hand of the slide uh, from a meta-analysis from about six years ago now, I think this was pu uh, published in 2015. Uh, you see the summary statistics of that meta-analysis at the bottom. Uh, for both social isolation and loneliness. And you see that there's a elevated risk uh, associated with incident dementia there. So taking this all together, does this make social engagement a appropriate intervention uh, target? Uh, and the first question we have to ask ourselves, of course, is it a mod modifiable risk factor? Uh, I don't know about you, but I often have claimed in my discussion sections, you know, looking at social support and social networks and social engagement, like this is really important because it's a modifiable risk factor. Well, you know, is it truly? Uh, but these days we think of so many things that are modifiable. Everything is modifiable, whether we think about DNA or, uh, you know, cardiovascular risk factors. We certainly hope to modify it climate and climate change, we need to modify the climate. You know, last night we even learned that personality is modifiable. Good, good grief from Dan and Patrick and Susan. So, you know, maybe social engagement is as well. By the way, uh, you know, my own kids would probably disagree with the idea that personality is modifiable, but granted that's based on a sample size of one. Um, anyway, is it a modifiable target? <laughs> And then given the complexity, there is some complexity to the concept of social engagement. You know, what would be the specific uh, social engage engagement elements that we would target in any sort of intervention? And also, um, you know, if we do so, do we adopt a sort of person-centered approach? Uh, you know, Christine already talked about this in the, in the, in the context of the SMART trial. Uh, but we can think of it as like it depends on the person and the, the setting in which the person lives their uh, his or her daily life that the, the find that should uh, inform us what that specific target should be for improving social engagement. So we can call that a person centered approach, maybe a precision approach, precision behavioral medicine. The term no doubt has already been coined by someone here in the audience. Uh, 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 I will say, though, if we think about precision behavioral medicine and medicine, 
Um, I have some of my own thoughts about whether that is the most effective way to achieve health opportunity and health equity for all at a population level. But hey, that could be a good theme for another ABMI, ABMR meeting, right, Anna? I don't know if you are here, but uh, we can talk about that. Um, and then finally, uh, if we think about interventions, you know, what is the age or the timing? Uh, again, Christine already brought, brought up this idea of a life course approach, uh, but that's a serious issue in any kind of prevention of dementia. When do you start this? You know, obviously we focus most of our research on older adult populations, but some of us would really claim that might be too late to really intervene and modify that, that slope of decline in cognition. Um, and there isn't actually a lot of really uh, solid, I would say, uh, intervention trials uh, on, you know, that target social engagement. The one example that I always come up with is the experience score uh, study that Linda Fried and her colleagues at Hopkins uh, did in the early 2000s. Uh, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over this, but uh, uh, if you're not familiar with it, what they did uh, was engage older adults uh, from the communities of color in, in Baltimore and uh, invited them to help out in high schools with mentoring and working with uh, high school students in their own communities. And they had sort of a waiting list control group and uh, a wait list control group and uh, noticed some differences between the participants in the, in the intervention arm and the wait list control group in terms of several cognitive outcomes that you see here, mostly focused on executive functioning and memory. <clears throat> so uh, to finish uh, this, uh, so what are we to do? Uh, well, I was very fortunate to be uh, uh, approached a couple of, almost a couple of years ago by a, a computer engineer here from the Bay Area, actually, who had founded a company called Mivera. Uh, I can take you to the website here. Uh, I don't have a clicker to pull it up, but that's okay. Uh, anyway, we started talking and, uh, and she has this idea of uh, working with older adults in the community who wanted to age in place, as we say, who wanted to continue living in their own house, in their own communities. But many older adults, as we know, slowly start experiencing daily challenges, challenges in their daily life. They have instrumental needs, as we say, and social needs. And what she wanted to do is, and, and in our research, she, she came, she found me, and we started talking about it. And her idea is to work with these older adults, have them identify members in their social network that might be able to help them from time to time. And she would then also develop a, a sort of a smartphone um, application uh, that would prompt an older adults every day with very simple questions about what they might need that day. Uh, maybe someone to cook a meal for them, for some company, uh, maybe take them to a doctor or pharmacy, those kind of very simple uh, type of questions in the hopes that the, and then that information will be channeled, channeled back to her computer. And then she hopes to develop eventually some uh, AI ML algorithm then to uh, connect the need with one of the members in the social network of that older adult. And the older adult could be a neighbor or living in a community, but it could also be a daughter or a son living on, a, you know, in, on the other side of the country. All right, so together we, uh, uh, we then developed this uh, uh, idea to uh, uh, maybe uh, put together an application for a small business uh, uh, grant, which we did. And uh, you see here the overall goals of this pilot study that we just submitted. Uh, so this is uh, put together in the SBIR application for NIA. Uh, and so I will finish by telling you, I have no ownership in this company, so I don't really have a conflict of interest uh, yet at least. Uh, but uh, given that we are close to Silicon Valley here, if you know of any investors that might have an interest in this kind of work, please come see me after, after the session is over. We would be very interested in, in, um, in finding more resources to do this work. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we started a few minutes late, so we're going to go over uh, a little bit just to make sure that we get our full hour. So uh, lastly, we have Dr. Scott Hofer, PhD from the University of Victoria in British Columbia. 
He is a professor of psychology and holds the Harold Moore MD and Wilhelma Moore MD Research Chair in Adult Development and Aging. He's the director of the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health. He's also a past president of Division Five of the APA and also the Society of Multivariate Experimental Psychology. His interests include the replicability, replicability and generalizability of longitudinal studies in psychology and the health sciences and today he will talk to us about developing and validating digital biomarkers for dementia prevention and intervention. Thank you. We clearly like long titles in Victoria. Um, it is so good to be here with you all. And Alyssa, thank you for making this happen. Uh, it's wonderful. So we, um, we heard over the last couple of days about the importance of longitudinal design and data. Uh, uh, from Terry Moffitt, from Caspi, from the, the biological uh, markers uh, session yesterday and many questions about that. Uh, and there's also been some issues. It's like, that's often not enough. If we want to capture individual change, is this person changing? And we need something different. These kind of long-term longitudinal studies have been very important. We understand a lot more about individual change, about individual differences and in rates of change and many of the risk factors and markers. And you've just heard a, a number of excellent talks about that. Uh, there's been a number of studies that have attempted to look at change points uh, within these kind of widely spaced longitudinal designs. And uh, uh, Justin Carr led a, a, a paper a couple of years ago trying to summarize uh, uh, many of these research findings. This is just one from Valger Thorvaldsen and colleagues in Sweden based on the H70 and the Kungsholmen study, uh, finding that, that uh, there's a, an acceleration in change in, in speed and memory and spatial ability prior to dementia, as much as 10 or 12 years prior to diagnosis of dementia. Uh, so we, we know that individuals are changing more rapidly and they're beginning to show these, these measurable changes on some of these more sensitive cognitive tests years before it becomes apparent years before they can identify, you know, uh, subjective cognitive decline or begin to see these things. Now, this is at the group level. We have attempted to understand through simulation and through actual analysis of data like this, can we capture individual change? Can we begin to see this and, and detect it? And we can't, we need a lot more data, especially data around that change point itself. Uh, and these widely spaced designs often two or three years apart in terms of assessments is insufficient to do that. But we know that these changes are occurring earlier. And I just wanted to, to point to the, the uh, Clifford Jack paper and, and model showing uh, you know, kind of theoretically what the kind of cascade of changes might look like. They put cognition much more, much more proximal to, to dementia, diagnosis of dementia, biomarkers and other neuroimaging markers are earlier. But we think that this is a good target. So we know that clinical detection happens too late for many of these preventative or early declines. We need to capture it when these changes are beginning to occur. So to being able to detect it in individuals. But we also know that there's a lot of things that matter. And we've, you know, the variety of modifiable factors, healthy behaviors, these matter for all of us in terms of our day-to-day our -day functioning, in terms of our changes over time. These are risk factors that matter. And they also matter for the, uh, the, the assessment of your cognitive performance on that day, on that occasion, and we know that. So we, we know that these are, are factors related to our functioning, but they're also temporal, temporally related, and they're dynamic. So the, the, the focus here is really on innovative innovations in longitudinal design, but also in the tools for these kinds of, 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 uh, of assessments. What we're really interested in is, is this individual changing more rapidly than they have in the past? So it's relative to that individual because we know that different people have different levels of performance from early in life and from a variety of origins and variety of causes, but this kind of sets up these individual differences and they do track across the lifespan. So we, we've got to make these, these the, the detection of change relative to an individual's past performance, relative to their baseline. And then of course, the effects of modifiable lifestyle factors are very important in this whole, in this whole endeavor. Uh, a few years ago, starting in 2017, we were approached by a donor in Victoria 
whose partner had a very poor patient journey in, with dementia. Uh, really issues and problems in getting assessed and in diagnosed and in, 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 in helping to move forward. So uh, this is Neil and Susan Manning Cognitive Health Initiative and they provided significant funding that allowed us to work with a professional developer and develop this MyCog Health app, which is now available on the app stores. Now, Martin Slowinski has, has been in this area for some time as well. He developed his own app and NIA has invested uh, significant resources to fund a, a new cognitive assessment platform for mobile devices and also separately with a Northwestern group uh, with the NIH toolbox, developing the mobile, uh, you uh, work for that. So keep an eye on that. Uh, those will be coming out relatively soon. These are major advances. Um, and I wanted to mention our uh, a, a wonderful friend and collaborator, Jeffrey Kay at, at Oregon Health and Science University, who for years has been invested in this, this kind of detection of individual changes much more early in a much more sensitive way. Now he's, he's focused on passive assessments. So uh, highly monitored homes, monitored vehicles, uh, wearables, and a whole variety of, of, of ways to, to measure uh, functioning in a variety of ways. Uh, activities, sleep, uh, lifestyle patterns, engagement with others, and uh, made significant advances in this area as well. It's very challenging. I mean, he, the, the amount of data that's being able to be collected on an individual uh, over time is stunning. And the challenge there is, again, like the challenge we have, detecting that signal. Are these individuals changing more rapidly or in different ways that is that is predictive of later health states or dementia outcomes. So very important too, and uh, we've, we've been, a, uh, it's been wonderful to work with him and we have some of these, these smart homes in Victoria and also with colleagues in, in Ottawa and they're, they're placed all over. And I, and I just men mentioned, we're working uh, with the uh, Canadian Consortium uh, in Aging on a clinical trial, part of the Worldwide Fingers Study, the Can Thumbs Up Study, it will be launching that where our app will be in there for risk stratification and, and to look at uh, perhaps more sensitive outcomes in this trial. So the, the use cases that really motivate this, uh, number one was, was what our donor presented us with, this challenge uh, to use this kind of tool, this kind of uh, tool in primary care to, to provide better assessment tools that are low cost, efficient, the individuals can be, could do this themselves uh, at home in their own time to determine whether cognitive change is progressive. So our target is much like what was discussed here already. We wanna be able to detect change within an individual within a, within a window, six months, a year, year and a half. And that is, that's a goal. That's, a, that's our real target here. It's not something we can do with typical longitudinal designs, but with these new tools and with more intensive measurement designs, we think we can. So that's the promise here. And that's what a number of these new studies are working on. We think it will improve to, uh, power in, in trials to detect at-risk individuals. It's possible to use these kinds of tools for large surveillance cohorts. Um, the idea of being able to measure people when they're well, when they're healthy, to have that kind of baseline, have that opportunity to detect change relative to, to their own baseline and their own history of functioning is, is a very important concept. And that's again, what longitudinal studies around the world are all about. Okay. And I, I, I did wanna say about preventative interventions, the opportunity for mobile or web-based interventions is very important. We're seeing a lot of these kind of psychoeducational, but also other types of interventions. And I think people are, are interested and willing to participate in that. So there's another colleague, Sam Lewitt Victoria, who's developed this Path First app which allows you to develop your own interventions and launch them on an app and, and to be able to, to control and, and, uh, and follow up individuals in this way. So we're, we're beginning to partner and build that out. Uh, this is really just a restatement of what I've kind of just said. This idea of temporal layering, this idea that we need more and better assessments on individuals, more frequent assessments on individuals to detect these changes. So this is what's, what's been referred to as a measurement burst study. It has a long history, the kind of daily diary work that, that goes back at least you know, 100 years maybe um, is, is, is this kind of thing. Uh, well, we're measuring people within a day, across multiple days, and then repeating this at, at different intervals uh, to, to be able to get these snapshots of, of a person's dynamics and functioning and changes over time. And again, this is important because there's a lot of sources of variation. Many of these, uh, and uh, we have a number of studies now that show how, 
how, how sleep, how physical activity, how stressors you experience, uh, all impact your, your, your functioning, your well-being on that day. And, and we see this daily variation. But we also see that these things accumulate and matter and begin to show changes in your functioning over time. And that's, again, what we want to capture, what we want to intervene on. And you've just heard about some, many of the modifiable factors. Both a challenge and an outcome of these kinds of designs are, re are retest effects. People learn to do the test when they're exposed to you know, these, these tests repeatedly. And again, often we're doing relatively short uh, 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 tests. Uh, sometimes we use designs where we measure them multiple times within a day. Our typical design is to measure them once a day, often in the, in the late afternoon or evening. And, and then to show these changes. And th this just shows that there are these re retest effects. This is on measures of speed. So people are increasing their performance. Uh, when, you come, when you measure them again, three months later, they, they, uh, they show some de decline from their, their past last performance. And then they show that learning curve again. This idea of practice or learning is also a very important marker in itself. It's, it's a part of many of our cognitive tests to detect change and, and, and functioning. And, and we think we can use that as well. But what we really want to model is, is a person's kind of maximal or asymptotic performance in terms of these more sensitive detection of change in six months within a year. And that's, our, that's been our focus here. It's a, it's a, I mentioned Jeff Kay, that's a kind of a, uh, uh, it, it's a way to collect a lot of data. This is a more structured way. It, it really more aligns with what we typically do in longitudinal studies. We're just doing it more, more frequently, more often, more intensively. There's been some reviews on, on, on use of mobile cognitive assessments. I just wanted to, to point to that. Again, targeting that these hopefully are more sensitive. We can, we can measure people more frequently, more continuously, and they can be administered remotely. Uh, one of the things we've done recently is work with Sage Bio Networks and developed an e-consent module uh, for, for these mobile uh, kinds of tools. So we can actually con uh, uh, consent, re recruit consent and deploy studies completely remotely. And we've gotten this through a variety of ethics uh, in, in both uh, US and Canada. Uh, with, with Jeff Kay, we, we looked at what criteria do we really want to, do we need, do we want to develop with these kinds of tools? Uh, I do want to say that there are a variety of cognitive assessment tools for mobile devices, uh, but they're they're proprietary. They're often very expensive, and and we and we can't we, we we just can't use them in a sustained, large scale way. And so that was again a real focus of why we developed our own app. It's expensive, and it's expensive to maintain. I understand the, the, the reason for this kind of model, but if we're gonna move forward as a field, as a science, and, and, and really look at, look at how these work, we need it to be low cost. That might be for me. Uh, anyway, you can read that, and it'll be available later. This is the MyCog Health app. It's a very flexible uh, assessment platform. Uh, we have a variety of, of, of tools in the, in the back to develop surveys of, of really many, any different type you, you want to, to deploy on mobile devices. Um, we have a variety of, of uh, cognitive tests here, and uh, two of these are from some previous work of Martin Sawinski and colleagues, the symbol search and the, the dot memory. We wanted to build on, on what he had done and is deploying at the Einstein uh, aging study, but, but and also is carrying forward in the new NIA work. And uh, so these are the current tests. We're adding a couple more now, uh, working with Mario Paris on uh, the short-term memory binding test. We're looking to, to add that in. And again, most of our studies include multiple streams of data like this. We're, we're always interested in measuring uh, continuous physical activity, functioning, sleep. Uh, uh, one of our students uh, included blood pressure and, and in her recent dissertation showed how daily variation in blood pressure is related to daily variation in cognitive functioning. Uh, after adjusting for some of these other factors. So these, these are all related day to day and they're all targets for potential intervention and they do matter in longer term uh, with in-person change. Uh, this is just a, a, just to show one of our, our, our longer term feasibility pilots. It was really to look at, at usability. Uh, are people willing to do this over, over uh, sustained duration? So this was, this was a, a year long study. We had 17 people, not many, but it was, it was very good for us to deploy an app and a variety of wearables and, and to see that people were really engaged and they were delighted to be part of this study. We had, I think 96% of, of the data uh, uh, 
uh, in the first two births we had as, as complete. And that's a lot of assessments, you know, because we were doing multiple assessments within day over five days and then repeated bursts like this. So I just wanted to show that. This is what some of the data look like. Uh, we, we weren't able to fit complex models to this. Again, it was just feasibility, but we're now launching a variety of other studies. And this is reported in, in uh, experimental aging research by Paul Brewster. Uh, I'm excited about the next steps and we're deploying these now. Uh, they, uh, the Can Thumbs Up Dementia Prevention Trial I mentioned, uh, we, we're starting with a pilot this fall and that's including a variety of, of colleagues across Canada. It's gonna lead to a full trial uh, in, in the spring. Uh, we're deploying a study focusing on subjective cognitive decline and including uh, participation within primary care offices. So we wanna begin to deploy it clinically uh, to see, to, to learn and work with, with clinicians to see how these, these more intensive measurements and, and individual changes may map on and, and add to the kind of toolbox that clinicians use. Typically we just see a mental status exam and then uh, they come back in a year and, and, and it, we don't have a lot of resources like this in place up in, up in uh, Victoria or BC. Uh, what I'm excited about is this idea of optimal design kind of measurement. We don't really know how often to measure individuals to be able to capture these short-term changes and, and to be able to look at these, these change points. Is this person changing more rapidly? Are they showing progressive uh, changes within a year if they present with, with cognitive decline? Um, so we're interested in this. Um, we've, we've, we've done these kind of designs before, uh, multiple times within a day, AM, PM, end of day. Uh, we're, we're uh, in these different arms, we're, show, we're having the same test exposure, we're just doing it in different ways. And so we're gonna learn a lot about this and about some of the uh, characteristics of these tests and, 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 and our models. And my final slide, I just, you know, precision cognitive health. This is really, we need, we need longitudinal data. We need to evaluate changes within a person relative to where they were in the past and, and, and their history. Uh, we're very interested in, in, in within person exposures and modifiable lifestyle factors. These are all intervenable and we wanna be able to, to see what we can do at a population level, what kind of tools, what kind of uh, prevention uh, things can we do. And uh, the idea that we can embed trials within these kinds of designs and studies, the, the just-in-time trials, these, the smart designs uh, is, is very exciting to consider here. And I think we're, we're poised with the tools to begin to really explore and examine and, and evaluate many of these new designs. Thank you. I think this has been a very informative session. I would just like to uh, just for and please come up to the mic if you have any questions. Uh, as people are doing that, I'd like to underline one point: uh, how important it is that we have early pre-symptomatic detection of dementia and how we have these risk determinants. Because once people show symptoms for dementia, that's too late. There's so much underlying damage to the brain structures by that point. It's very, very difficult for us to do any type of effective treatment at that point. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Suzanne Segerstrom from the University of Kentucky. And uh, can you hear me okay? I'll just take that off in a second. Um, so uh, as you know, there have been lots of drug trials for um, drugs that have been effective in clearing A beta from the brain, but without any significant impact on cognition. Um, so what do you all think about A-beta as a biomarker or a surrogate endpoint for Alzheimer's disease? All right, everybody's yeah. pointing, they're pointing at me. Um, <laughs> Clearly. You know, uh, that's a really great question. Um, uh, I'm not a molecular scientist, but... Um, you know, I think there's a lot of controversy over A beta, um, just to give a primer on A beta, you know, so what happened is, you know, in the 80s, all of a sudden, there were a lot of these uh, autosomal dominant genetic uh, mutations that were tracked to A beta processing. 
So Down syndrome, for example, trisomy 21, you know, everybody who lives long enough with Down syndrome will get Alzheimer's and it was tr tracked to trisomy 21. And there are now, you know, five or so of these autosomal dominant mutations that all seem to be involved with APP processing and amyloid deposition. So it was like, aha, it's amyloid, you know? And, and then that sort of took off and, and most of, 90% of the NIA's budget went to amyloid, whatever. And, you know, a lot of drug discovery and a lot of companies that then left Alzheimer's because it was so difficult. And, you know, it's it, the jury's still out. I mean, and it, it just got murkier with Aduhelm. So Aduhelm was the, was the drug that was approved this summer by the FDA. And, you know, half the people on the committee quit because they didn't recommend that it got approval, et cetera. So, you know, what a mess, right? And so it exposed a lot of the, the conflicts, uh, conflict of interest in the FDA and how things get a, approved. And, you know, um, the Alzheimer's Association was really pushing it. So it's really a fascinating story, but the poor patients are left with, you know, what do I do? And um, uh, you know, and it's a hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, and oh yes, it may cause brain edema and, 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 you know, micro hemorrhages. So uh, it, it's tough. Um, I, I think amyloid, you know, this is just my, you know, somewhat, uh, uh, you know, so half in half out sort of view, but amyloid clearly is very important. It does seem to be a good biomarker. Uh, PET scans of amyloid are really helpful in a lot of ways. If you're not sure if somebody has Alzheimer's or not, and you get a PET scan, and they have a clean PET scan, you can pretty much say they don't have Alzheimer's disease. So, so there, there, it is helpful in a lot of ways. I guess the question is, is amyloid, you know, people say it's necessary, but not sufficient. That's sort of the, 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 the you know, latest sort of phrase. So you have to have amyloid. And it seems that amyloid does track with Alzheimer's, but it doesn't seem like it's all just amyloid. And when you look at cognitive outcomes, oddly enough, amyloid doesn't track as well as tau in terms of the cognitive outcomes. So it's, it's a great question. I think the field is really scratching their head and trying to resolve a lot of this. APOE, you know, is, it, is an important receptor, definitely involved in, a, in, in amyloid. So when you look at the genetic stuff, it all, a lot of it really points to amyloid. When you look at the biomarkers, amyloid seems to track, but then when you come to the cognitive outcomes and the drug discovery, it's just not quite working. The, the, you know, the, the, um, the thought is, oh, everybody says, well, it was too late, you know, getting back to this idea of symptoms. So now the field is saying, well, maybe it was that it was too late, I'm not sure I completely believe all of that because some of it was, you know, in the MCI stage and you'd think you'd have some sort of benefit. It, we're not talking about advanced dementia where I agree it's, it is too late. So I, you know, it's, it's a great question. I think the field is, you know, still in the middle of it. Hi, uh, Candace Price from UC Davis. So uh, we're talking about, you know, having needing more data from longitudinal studies to understand the best timing in which we should intervene for preventing really anything um, as, as it relates to aging. Um, but for those of you that are conducting these, in, these lifestyle intervention trials for the prevention of dementia, cognitive, cognitive decline, uh, what is your inclusion and criteria in terms of the target group that you're recruiting into the um, study? And what guided that decision? Um, so, trouble here. Yeah, so I think the question was in terms of the prevention studies, what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Yeah. Yeah, like uh, what target group are you including to the study given that we don't know the optimal time frame in life? Ah, to ah, ah. Okay, in terms of the life course, you know, we're, we, we can only do so much in terms of the five-year grant cycles, but um, we're mostly targeting older, older people, at least in my study, we're, we're targeting older adults, they were 70 plus, who had subjective cognitive complaints and at least two risk factors. Um, so we felt they had to have something that we could, you know, intervene on, and we didn't want to have, uh, we didn't, they couldn't have dementia. So it, it's, it's tricky because you, there may not be enough movement over two years. On the other hand, we felt that was the, the best time to intervene at, at risk people. 
Um, that's kind of what most of World Wild Fingers is. It's, it's, it's older adults at risk. I, and then there are a number of drug studies now that are doing primary prevention. Mostly they're taking people, so the A4 trial, for example, they're taking people who have um, uh, pet positive, so they have a, you know, amyloid positivity by pet, but they don't have dementia yet. So that's another way to go is using the biomarkers. Um, Diane, which is a, do, do, a dominant, dominantly inherited uh, Alzheimer's something network. Um, Diane is a very large observational and drug trial um, treatment program that um, they're taking people who have an autosomal dominant gene. And then what they're doing is they're taking people and they're saying, well, you know, you around now you probably would have been getting your your uh, dementia based on your family history or whatever. And so th that's a different way. That's another um, drug trial that's trying to address. Uh, they're a little younger because of the uh, it, it, autosomal dominant tends to be early onset Alzheimer's. But in general, those are some of the strategies. This is an incredible panel and we're learning so much. And I'm just gonna ask if you can keep your answers short because we have so many questions to get through, thank you. The Jude Carroll from UCLA. Uh, my, hopefully the question will be a short answer. Um, I'm interested in the uh, MyCog Health app. It's such a fascinating um, project. And I'm curious how you would handle the practice effects with those measurements. Um, and if there's like a statistical adjustments or if you're seeing practice effects, I would be really interested in hearing a little more on that. Thanks. Yes, it, it, I mean, that is, uh, that is a major challenge. Um, we need to detrend the data. So a number of my students and colleagues are interested in the daily variation. So we need to be able to detrend that to look at variation in cognitive functioning. Uh, we've, we've done it a variety of ways and there's uh, some innovations in a Bayesian method. Um, Marty Slowinski and I published a paper some years ago on a double negative exponential model for these multiple bursts. So we're really trying to fit, fit that acceleration where we're getting an estimate of that asymptote. So it, it does involve some, some, uh, you know, some statistical modeling of the data like that. Um, more, more simply with some of the, the other designs, we're, we're simply fitting a polynomial to that, to that curve. Uh, that's not so satisfactory when you're interested in the curve itself and you want to look at learning and, and how learning is associated over time and, and how individual differences are. But we, we're, we're moving towards some of these uh, reevaluation of these models for use because we want to use these kinds of, of outcomes uh, to provide back to the clinician in an interpretable way uh, to be able to understand the characteristics of these tests over time. Uh, so this measurement, you said short, but this quickly, this, this, this measurement study, it does matter. The kinds of, of assessment protocol we use to the kinds of models we fit, it appears that when we measure people more frequently with very short tests, four, four or five times within a day, we see very little practice effect. But when we, when we do it uh, every day or so, we seem to see a little more in terms of that, that learning. Uh, that, that number of items being exposed to a, a test as we typically are, it tends to show that, that greater. Uh, but please get in touch with me. And uh, yeah, I'd love, love to uh, make this available. Have a look at it. It's on the app stores and there's a demo. And uh, we're working on a, on a better back end to allow individual investigators to actually uh, run their own studies. So we'll, we'll take one you. more question and then I'm if sorry. you have other, <laughs> other questions afterwards, feel free to come up and talk to the speakers. Um, uh, Dan Rosick, Northwestern University. Great talks. Thank you, everyone. Um, I wanted your thoughts on um, this interesting phenomenon of toleration of neuropathology. So many of you probably know that upon autopsy, um, as many as uh, there's a lot of people that show a, a large numbers of large, large amounts of tau and amyloid in their in their in their brains upon autopsy, but in life they did not show the clinical syndrome of dementia. In other words, they're, they're tolerating the, the pathology, they're living with the disease. So in addition to you know, the clearing away of you know, tau and amyloid that you've talked about, it, is it also possible that these risk factors that, you, that you've been talking about today could also be predictive of another approach of like tolerating the, you know, this neuropathology or living with the disease? 
thank you, Dan. Uh, great question. And as I was listening to the other presentations here and your questions, uh, I was already wondering that we need to bring up in this uh, in this conversation the concepts of cognitive reserve and brain reserve that you are clearly alluding to. And yes, there is a lot of work uh, trying to figure out what that is, how we can improve cognitive reserve, which is essentially defined as the ability to um, keep performing at, uh, at very high levels in spite of ongoing pathology. Uh, and it's been proven to be difficult to get at that concept. And, uh, and so uh, when we think about prevention, we can think about it in two ways. Is, is there a way through whatever interventions, pharmaceutical, behavioral, whatever it is, to slow down the actual pathological process? Or the other way is, can we improve cognitive reserve in the sense that even though the pathological process will be ongoing, we keep functioning at a high level. Uh, uh, where are we with that? Um, the best marker so far we have found is education, educational attainment. Uh, uh, but that's not the only one people use as a marker of this cognitive reserve. Uh, certainly, uh, you can think of certain aspects of social engagement, cognitive being engaged in cognitively stimulating activities may contribute also to that uh, cognitive reserve. And then finally, uh, we need to differentiate cognitive reserve from the concept of brain reserve, right? That's the ability of the brain to compensate for areas that are affected by the disease pathology and maybe create alternative circuits to uh, perform the same things as, uh, as you did before. So great question. Thank you, Dan. Wonderful. With, uh, with an increasingly aging population, these questions are, of course, becoming more and more uh, uh, urgent and pertinent. So uh, I'd like to thank the panel for uh, their time today. Again, if you have some follow-up questions, feel free to come up. And uh, I'll try to ensure that uh, chat questions make it to our panelists as well. You've got uh, until uh, 1130, I believe, with some free time now. I encourage you to take advantage of the hikes around here. There's a hilly one right behind the cafe and another beautiful one over here. Thank you, Christopher. Amazing panel. There are many more questions. Luckily, we have another day together with our speakers. There are many Zoom questions. If you have a few minutes, you can go up to Elisa Hamlet and answer them, um, including one from Liz Nielsen, who is one of our sponsors with our NIA R13 grant. I have some announcements from 1440. Um, there is a hike now. There is a hike leader waiting for us, and it is just meeting across the way at the lodge. And it will be a wonderful way to be together, to decompress, and to learn a bit about the amazing forest that we're in. There's also stick fit yoga. So find out what that is if you want to stretch and move your body. And that is just right out here at the amphitheater. Um, I also wanted to just remind us that, you know, it was really hard for every one of you to come here and you worried about COVID and we made this kind of fool, you know, I'm not going to, nothing is foolproof, but we made a good protocol and we felt really liberated on day one. We were all vaccinated.